Okay. Um, first of all, just a reminder that this is for adults only. There will be adult content. So if you do have children in the room, have them go to their bedrooms or hang out in a different location, if you would, please. But we want to welcome all of you to our first parent virtual session tonight for this school year. It's being sponsored by the whole child team of the Rapid City Area School District. Um, what we would like you to do is sign into the chat with your, with your name and what schools your children attend. And this is just for our data. Um, if there's more than one adult watching, include all the names. So the chat is at the bottom of your screen if you don't know where that's at. So it's just down at the bottom. If you linger over there, your chat will pop up. The other thing is throughout Holly's um, session that she's doing with you, we're not gonna interrupt her with questions, but we'll ask questions at the end, but feel free to type your questions into the chat and I will jot those down and then I will ask those of Holly at the end. So I want you to, I wanna introduce Holly Strand at this time, who is a forensic examiner with internet crimes against children. And we really appreciate her time tonight. So welcome to Holly. Thank you. So I am going to throw a ton of stuff at you as quick as I possibly can. So we have time for questions. So um, just in general, I speak very fast. I will try to keep it slow, but um, um, I am a forensic examiner with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office assigned to the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Basically, I am sitting in my computer lab. I am a lab rat. I tear apart computers, phones, tablets, servers. Um, I'm assigned to cases of child pornography, child exploitation, child solicitation, and child sex trafficking. So basically, if it has to do with kids in the internet and a crime, that's what I get tagged with. Um, we also have all the tools. We end up with every homicide, missing person, and mountain lion poaching case. So definitely get the variety. So let's just jump right into it. There we go. What could go wrong with kids and electronics? Um, I'm going to get into depth on the digital footprint, the inappropriate content. I wish I could see all your faces because I would, I would love to see the, the show of hands for how many people have been online, not looking for anything inappropriate and come across something, um, whether it be porn or ads or something that was absolutely inappropriate. I don't just look through devices that belong to suspects. I see a lot of kid devices, tons of teen devices. And the stuff that they have on their phones and their tablets and computers is sometimes horrifying. Some of the stuff is stuff that they are, that they're actually clicking on. Some of it's just stuff that pops up and stuff that there's, they're exposed to. Privacy breaches. Um, if, you, if you have kids at home, you, you start to see this trend of everywhere you go, they want your kid to go to a website. Put a box of cereal in front of them and it's kellogs.com enter in this code you get them a gift and it'll say you know go to this website and enter in all of this information and we'll give you you know some access to something else um, and when they go to these sites you see that it is what is your name how old are you what state do you live in and trying to explain to a six-year-old why somebody would want their data when you think of the, the phrase knowledge is power, data is power. Um, I tell people all the time, if I, if, you, if I took your phone from you and looked through it, I could tell you your fears, your fantasies, and what you believe are facts. And people will type things into a search bar that they would never say out loud. And when data collectors are collecting that kind of information, um, they know what to sell. They know what scares us. They know what motivates us. Um, it can be pretty scary, but there's a reason why they start collecting data from kids when they're six or seven years old, because knowledge is power. Sexual solicitation, cyberbullying, and sex torsion, I'm going to go into those in great detail. Pornography exposure. A few years ago, I was in an elementary school, and we had this little guy in the audience raise his hand, and he says, what if somebody shows you porn over and over, even though you ask them to stop? And this is at an elementary school. Um, I had a dad say, if you look through my 11-year-old daughter's computer, she's looked at more porn in the last six months than I've seen as an adult male in my entire life. I had a teenage boy at a middle school follow me out after a presentation and ask me what a creative way to, what would be a creative way to ask his parents to put a filter on the internet without telling him that he just couldn't stop looking. 
I had to look through a device that belonged to a 16 year old boy and he was bored with two sums, three sums, four sums and bestiality. And he had been researching rape porn. And I remember the parents thinking, as saying something to the effect of like, do we have a bad kid? Is he a bad egg? And it's like, no, you have a good kid with a bad addiction. The average age in our country that kids are exposed to pornography is five years old. Pornhub, which is one of the, the number one sites for pornography in the United States, um, they tracked, Bitdefender tracked the, the traffic going in and out of Bitdefender or of Pornhub, and 22% of the traffic in Pornhub is kids 10 and under. I have a good friend of mine that struggles with a porn addiction, and he shared with me and said, you know, Holly, when I was at my worst, if I made it two hours without looking at porn, I considered it a pretty good day. I had another guy share with me, he said, you know, I, I kiss the ground my wife walks on. I love her, but because of my addiction, he said, it's wrecked everything. And so then we have to start asking, like, why is it that schools can put up every kind of filter, parents can put every kind of filter, every kind of block, and yet pornography seems to always make it through filters. It's in all the search bars. How does it end up there? Pornography is a multi-billion dollar industry. An industry that has billions of dollars at its disposal can put pop-ups anywhere they want. Um, they also have an understanding that they say if they can get a kid hooked young, they say they have a customer for life. That's why we, send, we tend to see it everywhere and especially on sites that go for kids and teens. No realistic supervision. When I was six years old, my dad taught me how to shoot guns. He never handed me a gun. He didn't know how to load, unload, store, manage. My parents never gave me the keys to their, their car and said, hey, you know, I know you're only six, but you can go ahead and play with that until you're old enough to figure out, you know, how it works. I say this because we will get cyber tips showing us that kids are being exploited. And when we reach out to the parents and we say, hey, have you gone through their phone or tablet lately? We'll let parents say, I don't, I don't even know how to turn it on. Or we have Apple devices and they got an Android for Christmas and I'm not even sure how to, how to use that. In our world, it's like giving a kid a gun and not knowing how to unload it, store it or manage it. Nothing is bad. Um, if you went back 50 years ago and you were to ask my parents, where did you get your information? Like, where did you know, how did you know what was going on in the world? They would have said the Rapid City Journal and the Nightly News. And that was pretty, that was pretty normal. And then if you were to say, like, where does your kid get their information? You would say, well, you know, from us, the extended family and the school and maybe church, right? And if, if somebody in there was giving our kid bad information, you could kind of shelter and protect that and, and cut off that, that stream of information. Nowadays, when you ask most adults and you say, well, where do you get your information? It's like, well, Fox News, CNN, Breitbart, MSNBC, Twitter, Facebook. It, and adults have a really difficult time sorting through information and figuring out what is actually real, what is made up, what is embellished. Our kids are no different. Our kids are wading through this same kind of stuff. And then the stuff that we're telling them, like it's not okay to choke somebody, it's not okay to steal, it's not okay to lie, respect your elders. They can get online and find thousands of, of people that get together in groups, respect your elders. There's groups that say you should shoot anybody over the age of 60 should be dead. They're a drain on society, they're a drain on medical, get rid of them. So here we are in our home saying respect your elders and they go online and they find groups that absolutely say the exact opposite of what we're saying. Or we, you know, we preach you know, consent and no adults touching a minor in a sexual manner. And then they go online and NAMBLA, which is the National Man Boy Love Association, they put a lot of propaganda out towards kids. Their slogan is sex before eight, as in eight years old. Sex before eight or it's too late. So our kids are getting a different stream of information in which a lot of parents aren't even having that conversation about, hey, what are you seeing online that contradicts what you're hearing in our home? No filter by parents. Um, when I was 12 years old, if you wanted to talk to me as a 12 year old, you either were part of my family, you went to my school, you played sports with me, or you would have to be a creepy stranger and find a way to gain access to me. Um, when I was growing up, we had a beautiful filter and it was called the home phone. 
We called the home phone, my parents answered, and they decided who got to talk to me. Um, there wasn't a lot of people that could talk to me during the school day that didn't go to school with me. I mean, couldn't pick up the phone and, and say, hey, can I talk to Holly Strand? I always tell people fair disclosure because uh, I lived at, I went to South Middle School and I lived in detention and my mom went to one of my trainings. She's like, Holly, nobody talked to you. You lived in detention. Like, that, that's fair enough, fair enough. But I say this because there's not a lot of parents I've met that would feel comfortable coming home, checking their mailbox and finding 200 letters addressed to their child from people all over the world. But yet when we go through a teenager's or even, even elementary school phone and they have thousands of messages they get from people all over the world throughout the school day. And when we sit down with parents, we're like, well, do you know this person? No, how about this person? No, that one's a registered sex offender on Florida. There, there's no filter, that filter is broken. Um, I co-chair the Western South Dakota Human Trafficking Task Force. The reason why we have sex trafficking with our youth in the United States is because of cell phones. Um, they're not calling the home phone and saying, hey, you know, um, can I talk to your 13-year-old your girl, your daughter? I would love to get her so hooked on meth that she'll sleep with this guy and give me the cash. Can I talk to her? Absolutely not. What we're seeing is that engagement is through devices, through the phone, in which the parent has no idea what is occurring until usually something's occurred and they're seeing um, other symptoms come out. Duplicity and anonymity. You have an Apple device, um, you have an iTunes account, and you have an Android device, you have a Gmail account. So no matter how many fake accounts a person may have or duplicate accounts they have, on that device, every single thing they do comes back to one Apple account or one Gmail account. Um, so there's nothing that's anonymous. Both Google and Apple openly say, yes, they collect our data, and yes, they sell with third-party companies. So there's nothing... We, we can't be duplicitous and, and the anonymity that we would hope to have online is not there, but our kids don't get that. So our kids believe that they can be one person face-to-face -face and then be completely different online. And that somehow that, that those two lives will never come together. Lack of real relationships. This ends up being one of my, my biggest soapboxes. Um, I was at Perkins one time and um, I, I'm a people watcher. I love, love, love watching people. And I always watch kids with devices in their hands. So I walk in and I'm listening and I hear him say something to the effect of um, something about grandma. So I'm like, oh, how cute is that? You know, grandma took him out to eat. But I do notice that he has a tablet in his hand and he's sitting right by. And I'm, you know, I'm just kind of paying attention to my friend, but also paying attention to this little guy. And the entire time we were there, the only words he uttered to his grandma was he told her what he wanted off the menu. And I'm looking at this woman who just seems kind of lost, like, you know, should I, she's kind of looking around, like, should I, you know, should I ask him questions? Should I, you know, should I watch what he's doing? I, and she's just sitting there. All my grandparents are dead. I would pay a million dollars to have a meal with my grandparents and my grandparents are gone. And all I could see is this little guy holding this piece of metal plastic and glass as though that was everything. And all I kept thinking is like, She's going to be dead, and you won't even remember what you were looking at. The other night, I was up at um, Olive Garden, and it was a mom, a dad, and three kids. I think probably about a 12-year-old, a 16- and 17-year-old, roughly about those ages. The 12-year-old did not have a phone, and the dad didn't have his phone out. The mom was on the phone the entire time, and the two older kids were on the phone the entire time. And all I could think is, you can't get that back. I tell people the day my parents die, I will regret every second I touched a phone in their presence. I mean, God forbid something happened to one of my kids or one of my foster kids. Like I would regret every second I looked at a device when I had a chance just to be in their space. But we're seeing more and more kids that real relationships don't matter. They're not as interesting, they're not as fun, and they take a lot of work. Um, I, was, uh, I was kind of complaining in the lab a little bit a while back. And I said, kids are so shallow. I mean, they block and friend each other over really dumb things. Like they block and friend, unfriend each other over um, their friends going through 
going through a lot of drama because their parents are getting divorced. She doesn't like my pictures quick enough. Um, she's friends with a guy that I have a crush on, block and unfriend, block and unfriend. And my coworker challenged me and said, you really don't see the same thing with adults. And I said, I had to sit there for a second. I was like, yeah, actually I do. I see family members do this. Who'd you vote for? Where do you stand on immigration? How about abortion? Where do you stand on the vaccine? Block and unfriend, block and unfriend, block and unfriend. And you see these kids get in these tiny little silos until they run out of people to block. And it's, it's sad, but you watch it. And it's not, just, it's not just kids, it's adults. And I think, unfortunately, we might be the ones leading the charge. Digital heroin. Um, years ago, they said that the, the kids in the United States were falling behind Japan, Russia, and Japan. And there was this big push that if somehow if we could get all of these electronics in all of the schools that our kids would catch up. They just needed tablets, they needed desktop computers, and they push, 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 right? Then you saw the grants, then you saw electronics over all the schools. Um, that's also when a lot of the schools went to no books, only, only tablets. So then they asked the people that build technology and they said, well, what do your kids think of this? And the most sought after schools in the Silicon Valley, the Wardolf School of the Peninsula, bans electronic devices for under 11s and teaches the children of eBay, Apple, and Uber, and Google staff to make go karts, knit, and cook. So I have my first master's in counseling psychology and my second master's in um, forensic science. And I love studying the human brain. I absolutely love it. I got to uh, how to scalp saw skull and remove a human brain at the coroner's office in Vegas. Um, I absolutely love it. So when they were questioning them about this, they were talking about uh, the effects on the brain. They mentioned two things pretty strongly in when they were talking about addiction and the fact that it doesn't make our kids smarter. So let's start with addiction. They show that every time our little phones beep, vibrate, we get a new Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, sports update, political update, we get this little kid of dopamine. So the same dopamine we get when we eat pizza, when we eat chocolate, drink beer, smoke set or smoke cigarettes, have sex, run a mile, right? So we get this dopamine. So this is what it looks like. You have a kid playing Fortnite or social media and it goes like this, dopamine, 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 till somebody says, put, the, put it away. Then the brain goes through withdrawals similar to heroin withdrawals. I have heard horror stories from parents that are saying, I have a really sweet kid. I took their device away and my kid attacked me. My kid cussed at me. My kid broke the lock of my door. My kid was digging my purse. My kid lied to me. And it sounds like they are, they're describing a, excuse me, a heroin addict, somebody who has taken drugs away from a child. I've talked to parents that have um, they've gotten their kids so used to having that digital pacifier that they keep a second tablet charged because they cannot manage their child if the electronics, if the, if the battery dies when they're out. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you guys have all seen kids will go, that will go on YouTube and they will research YouTube videos of other kids doing the, playing the games that they play, right? Um, they want the dopamine release that comes with watching it defeated without actually having to work for it. So this is what happens. We have kids who become addicted to watching other kids run, jump, build, explore, and play. They become teenagers who watch other teenagers run, jump, build, explore, and play. And they become entire families that sit on a couch. And you'll ask them like, oh, that was dark. Um, and you can ask them and you can like, well, what do you do as a family? Well, you know, we watch the, the survival show and the baking show and that kick decorating show. It's sad. I, I've had parents tell me, my kids used to ski, they used to hunt, they used to swim, they used to like go do all sorts of stuff. And now they spent the entire summer playing video games and on the couch. So the other part is, is, is it doesn't make our brains a whole lot smarter. So if you were to put electrodes on a child's head and say, I, hey, I just want you to go out and uh, grab a handful of sand and let it run through your fingers. Their brain will actually light up like a Christmas tree <clears throat> because one, they had to walk to get there. So there's exertion of energy, but they can feel it, they can sense it, they can hear it, and they're gonna have a bunch of thoughts about it. 
So their brain is going to light up like a Christmas tree. And the goal of making a really smart kid is you store information in different parts of their brain. And when you use your hands and you turn physical pages and you write on things, that's why they say make good cards, knit and cook, because they know it activates different parts of the brain. It stores it. Retention is greater, right? If you get a kid a tablet or a computer and you say, hey, I want your little avatar to pick up sand and let it run through the finger, about that much of their brain actually responds. Um, it's, it's just not the same. That's why they ban electronic devices for kids in, in, in higher schools. Um, it's, it's, it's frustrating because electronics are easier, but um, they don't always have the bang that we, that we hope that we're getting. All right, so child victims. Why do kids make such great victims? They have no idea what data limits are. You know, I remember my mom tapping on her foot because you couldn't be on the internet and get phone calls at the same time. So she's like, somebody could be calling. And so I didn't have time to get in trouble. I, I just, I had to get off before my mom went crazy. They're given tablets and phones at really young ages. So it's no longer buying film and developing film. They are so used to taking a thousand pictures. It doesn't shock me that when I get a device that belongs to a five-year-old, if I find 3,000 pictures of that five-year-old, that's all they do. They get so self-absorbed with watch me, look at me, um, so they get desensitized. They know how to Google, which provides information, pictures, and videos, a lot of times with things that they're not ready to see. They're curious. They have a need for attention. So our team is the team that um, during the Sturgis Rally and during other times of the year, we will go online, we will pretend to be kids, and we will sell children online. Um, and our guys can go on to local chat sites and put a picture of a teenage boy or a teenage girl and put something as simple as, hate my parents, and have 10 adult men hitting on them. I mean, just like that. That's it. Um, we had a guy drive eight and a half hours to hook up with what he thought was a 14-year-old girl that it was chatting on that started off just like that. She put something about, you know, hate my parents. And there he was. He drove eight and a half hours. Very thankful he was talking with one of our undercovers the entire time. Rebellion and then the backpack factor. So when you think about back in the days, when you wanted to know what was going on in the kid's world, you went through their bedroom, you went through their pockets, you went through their backpacks. And even for the schools, looking through and be like, hey, you're not bringing a Playboy into my school. You're not bringing, you know, Switchblade in my school. Things have changed significantly now because everything that goes on in the child's life is in that phone. If you want to know what's going on with a kid, you need to look through their phone. Every time we have a teenager commit suicide, they bring us the phone because the parents are like, I have no idea what's going on. And typically it's in the phone. It also limits the amount of, of, of supervision we have. Um, unfortunately, we've had kids showing other kids porn on the school bus on the, way to, on the way to school. And when you look at that and you're like, well, if a kid brings a phone into the school or on the school bus, looking at the outside of the device, you don't know what's in it. So the supervision is, is, is definitely changed. So let's talk about this digital footprint. So when I go through a device, a computer phone, tablet server, um, this is what it shows me. I hook it up, my forensic software, um, does a beautiful job and it puts it into categories, all the online postings, social media, texting, photos, videos, blogs, gaming activities, websites, and purchases. So here I am sitting in my lab, I'm a lab rat, and Homeland Security, FBI, OSI, basically all federal, state, local, tribal, and military law enforcement in Western South Dakota will bring me evidence to look through. Um, sometimes when I'm out on search warrants, I'll meet victims, I'll meet suspects, but most of the time I don't meet anybody. But just looking through one phone, I can usually tell if they're a Democrat, Republican, or independent. I can tell you if they're married, if they're single, if they cheat, if they lie, if they cuss, if they drink, if they do drugs. Usually their sense of humor, their favorite selfie look, uh, every medical condition they think they've had, their kids have had, their animals have had. Um, every insecure thought they've ever needed to search and have um, some feedback on. Now, that's just one device. 
Each one of us have that digital footprint on every electronic device we own. And then we have this cloud data where data brokers buy, trade, and sell our stuff all the time. So this is what we have. Now, I'm not worried about my digital footprint. I'm 44. Um, my digital footprint's out there. I am worried about our kids, though. I have an 8, 9, and 10-year-old at home. And I look and I think of all the information that they put out there, who looks at it? I'll look at it as a parent. Um, my, the kids that go to school with my kids, their parents will look at it. Teachers, principals, and coaches. I hear horror stories from teachers, principals, and coaches that talk about seeing stuff on social media that they'd have no desire to see of their students, but they're seeing it. It gets sent colleges and universities. So I told you, you know, you have an iPhone or an Android, all of it's saved. And then we add to the problem because we download apps and there's absolutely nothing in an app that says, I promise I won't sell your private information. So if we download a text messaging app, they say, hey, I'll give you my free app and I will take all your messages. That means if a data broker comes along and says, hey, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll buy all your, your data for, for $5,000, there you go. We have kids seeing this right here. Penn State dropped another prospect this morning due to social media presence. Actually glad I got to see the real person before we offered him. SMU came across an awful Twitter account today. Shame the kid was a really good player. On to the next one, get a clue. We have kids that are doing absolutely everything in the power. They're getting the best grades, they're working out, they're doing all of the activities that look really good on paper and they are absolutely wrecking every opportunity online. Um, we have kids that are losing, losing scholarships by stuff that they are posting and not necessarily publicly posting. Like I said, nothing is private. People that we don't like and people that don't like us um, tend to watch. And when we go out for something big like football or a big position, a lot of times that's when things filter to the surface. People have been watching the whole time. Strangers, online predators, and data collectors. I hope you would agree with me that um, when I say that kids, their digital footprint has a life of its own. It's definitely a whole different world than what we had. I always tell people, I feel like nowadays, our kids are kind of this little chunk of data and people look at it and decide whether it's worth something or not without even meeting, without even following up with it. So that brings us to sexting. I hate sexting. Um, within the, Every time school year rolls around, you just see me like, ah, oh, because my office gets flooded with phones and um, I, have to, I have to push pause on child porn cases and child exploitation cases to take care of sexting cases. And within a month of school starting, we have sexting in every single middle school. They are by far our worst, um, worst grade is middle school. And then most high schools and several elementary schools um, a few years ago, I got my first third grade sexting case, my third, my first elementary school case. They show nationwide the average age that kids are sending nude images is about nine years old, which is also consistent with the age, the average age kids are given a device that is internet connected is nine. So when we ask them, why are you sending nude images? To be funny, to impress a crush, to show a loyalty or love. A lot of those chats will go something like, you know, so-and-so sends nudes to her boyfriend. If you loved me, you would send them. I do love you. Then why won't you send them? Followed by the sending. Part of dating, the number one response that we get when kids come in and we say, well, why'd you send the pictures? Because we're dating. Well, why'd you send them? Because we're dating. Apparently, it's not just a teenage thing. One of my friends is in her 50s, and apparently some guy did ask her for nudes. And I said, like you're 50. And she said, that's what I said. I said, I'm 50. You don't even want to see that. And I said, well, <laughs> well, it's good to know. It's not just kids that are um, acting dumb right now, but many of them are pressured. Many of them feel like it's not something they're doing on their own. It's something that they feel pressured or coerced into doing. For somebody that looks at child pornography for a living, I can tell you that one of the things that I hate to do more than anything is to look through a teenage girl's phone. I, I absolutely hate it. The amount of requests that they can get on any given day is, is troubling. 
Um, girls will talk about walking in and having a guy that sits across to look at them and say, oh, you look really nice today. Thanks. And then they sit down and they look at their phone. And what does it say? Send me some nudes. So this is what we have. Kids get devices when they're little. They get really comfortable taking pictures of themselves over and over and over. Then they start with sexting. They start to get kind of selective with sending those pictures to people that they want. And then they move online. LiveMe is a live streaming app that has been downloaded 96 million times. It shares the user's location and allows users to search for who is streaming near them. Their website says the app is explicitly meant to be used by people over the age of 13. I'm 13 and she's 13 too. But that just isn't reality. Fox 11 monitored dozens of LiveMe streams, not staying long enough to see things get explicit. Don't play truth or dare. Why? But what we found was horrifying. I love your feet. Time and time again, the live streams featured girls who appeared to be extremely underage, with pedophiles openly trying to manipulate the girls into performing sexual acts for them. We also spoke to Dr. Lisa Stroman. She's a former FBI agent and current clinical psychologist. Now she's the director of the Digital Citizen Academy and Technology Wellness Center. So to me, it's, it's definitely a prostitution platform or turning into one. She's being notified of how many followers she's getting. We They're showed several disturbing live me streams to both women who were mortified by what they saw. This elementary school age girl was streaming herself singing. One viewer warns her to be careful for pedophiles and within seconds, they arrive. Commenters begin instructing the girl to pull her shirt up higher, to pull her pants down, and tell her, quote, she's so hot. She looks like she might be seven, eight years old. Um, I don't know if you caught in the upper hand corner, it was like 11.9 thousand followers. That she had 11.9. We have kids in our schools that can't find two people that would show up to a birthday party, but they can go online and find that kind of fanfare. Um, it makes sense why they, they go online. It makes sense why they stay online. Um, but unfortunately, these are the type of sites. You've got TikTok, you've got um, all of the Omegle, Chatterbait, all of those that they go on. And you have some guy saying you should make out, you should flash, you should do something, and then they jump on it. And that's what we end up with sex torsion. Um, it's not sexting. Sometimes parents in the beginning, when they're reading text messages, they're like, yeah, it's just, it sounds like a boyfriend, but it's not. It's usually an adult pretending to be a kid. Sometimes it's an over, older juvenile, might be part of a larger ringer network and the threats always increase. I'm gonna skip this video and I'm just gonna share with you. We just had our, we, t um, we went to trial in April on the biggest case I've ever worked. I've been in the field for 24 years and it's the biggest thing I've ever worked. And it started with a 12, at the time he was 11 years old and he's in Rhode Island and he thinks he's talking to a 13 year old girl. 13 year old girl sends nudes. The 13 year old nude pictures came from another little girl this guy was exploiting, sent them over. He basically talks this kid into sending nude pictures and then says, hey, if you send me a nude, if you send me this video of you playing with yourself, I'll give you a $250 Amazon gift card. Well, at 11 years old, that's a lot of money. He does it. The second he does it, this guy says, hey, I know who your mom is. This is her email address. This is her name. This is where you live. You're going to do what I say every single day. And about a month and a half later, he, he finally walks into his mom and he said, I, I'm, I'm sick of putting stuff in my butt for this guy, mom. You've got to make him quit. The IP address when Rhode Island did the investigation came back to Rapid City, South Dakota. We flew in kids from all over the country. We could have flown them in from all over the world. There were kids as young as seven that were involved. They were acting out daily with other kids, with siblings, with animals. Um, this right now is one of the number one cases the FBI is working nationwide. And it also has a much, much higher potential for suicide than um, cyberbullying. It's, it's huge. We have to teach kids to stay in control. So one of the things that I, I, I tell kids all the time is, if let's just say I ran over my phone in the parking lot. Okay, I go out, I get another Android, I log in with my Gmail account and everything comes back. There's, there's nothing private on this. If I take a selfie on, if I take a selfie and turn my phone off, 
that selfie has already been backed up to probably nine or 10 different servers, depending on what kind of apps that I have on my phone. There is nothing private. So I tell kids, I don't text anything. I don't email anything. I don't take pictures of anything that I wouldn't be comfortable being on the uh, front of the Rapid City Journal in the morning. If they don't want somebody to see something, they have to start by not taking it. That's how celebrities and everybody get their stuff hacked is they take nude images with a smartphone, it uploads to a server, somebody hacks it and they're out there. Um, Snapchat's pro-law enforcement and we got a snap or we got a, a cyber tip from Snapchat and they said, hey, we have a 12 to 15 year old girl, IP address comes back to rapid. Just in, in the notes, it said that she had taken the picture with Snapchat, but she had not sent it. And so when our agent was talking to the mom and she pulled, you know, she pulled her daughter out of her bedroom and was like, hey, what is this? And the daughter was so adamant. She was like, I didn't share it with anybody. I took the picture, but I didn't share it. And our agent was trying to explain, you actually, I have your naked pictures right here in a folder and I have my na your naked pictures back in my office. If you took it with a smartphone, you have shared it. There's nothing private on there. And the second that you take it, you have now shared it. I always tell people, um, because of the nature of my, my work, you can imagine some of the messages or emails I send. If anything that I send would need explanation, I pick up the phone and call. I just don't send anything that other people could come across and be like, that doesn't make sense or that looks really bad. We have to teach them that when they, especially with sexting, sometimes they get other people's images, they can't forward it. Sexting is a crime between two people in a relationship Typically, that's, that's what the law is referring to. When they forward somebody else's images, that is not, that's no longer sexting. If they pressure or coerce, that is no longer sexting. And when we go in the schools, we beg the kids not to start the habit. So when you see middle school collecting their, their classmates' pictures, and they trade them like they're baseball cards or football cards, and they get used to every single person they're dating asking for nudes, Here's the problem with that. We know that sometimes 18 year olds date 17 year olds or 16 year olds. And we also know that the day a kid turns 18, they don't delete all their accounts. So um, just by law, anybody that stores data has to run these filters for known child pornography. A lot of them run age and skin filters. So a 17 year old that gets caught sexting and is warned like, hey, you should probably knock it off. He did not heed the he did not heed the advice. And two months after his 18th birthday, we arrested him with felony possession of child pornography. There's nothing in law for 18 year olds. If if a 17 year old is trading nude images the day they turn 18, those underage kids on the device is now felony possession of child pornography. So we tell the kids it's <clears throat> it's really hard if that's what you've started to all of a sudden to, to break that habit automatically the day they turn 18 and trying to get them to ask for help if needed. The first time somebody asks them for, for nude images rather than after it's got out of control. What to do, um, save the evidence. Um, this is a big part of it. So, you know, the cyber bullying, um, I'm just gonna briefly, it's the same thing every year. You know, the sending mean text, photoshopping photos, creating fake accounts, um, it's the same thing we see every year. Nothing has changed with the cyberbullying, um, only the apps and the way they're doing it. So um, what we ask is that you save the evidence, whether it's sextortion, whether it's sexting, or whether it's cyberbullying. Um, there's some, some apps that are based in countries that do not like the United States. And so when we're trying to contain a child's image, we need to know what's on there before you delete it. Help them report the abuse. I'm a big one with teaching kids, hey, you have somebody on Minecraft that's being a jack wagon. Let's go to the website and let's report an abusive account. It teaches kids that there's some control with making those reports, but it also teaches kids if they want to be on the other side of that, if they want to be the jack wagon, that they can spend, you know, a year setting up their world and then they'll get their entire account destroyed and shut down if they want to be a chucklehead to somebody. Set up new accounts, model the right online behavior. This, is, this did not get to me until I'd been at ICAC probably two years. And all of a sudden it hit me that when I am teaching my kids how to cook, 
I talk out loud. When I teach them how to clean, I talk out loud. When I teach them how to box, shoot, you know, shoot guns, whatever it is, I, I talk out loud the whole time. And then all of a sudden I realize like, this is me teaching my kids about electronics. Basically them watching me on a phone. And all of a sudden I realize like this doesn't work. So I've gotten the habit of telling my kids, you know, I'm going to send a message to your dad, tell him how much I love him. You know, I was upset with grandma and I was going to send a message to all my friends telling about, I was upset with grandma and my side of it. And just asking, what do you think that'll do? That'll hurt her. Okay. What's, what's a better plan? You need to go talk to her. How about on Twitter? Somebody said something I totally disagree with. I'm going to light them up. And then I tell my kids, no, 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 no. If you can't sit down and have an intelligent conversation with somebody you totally disagree with, you have no business being online. I've never seen any good come out of a Twitter spat or a Facebook war. It just doesn't work. How about, you know, racist or uh, inappropriate jokes in teaching kids that your first response will teach other people whether you want more or not, how you respond. And then digital detox. We're in the business of taking away phones and uh, we take away a lot of phones. And um, I've had parents say, my kid can't live without it. We as a family cannot live without our child having their device. And um, we're just not gonna be able to make that work. We need the phone back. And then the beautiful part about being my job is that I also hear the stories about what happens when they get over that. And so I have a, you know, it was a pretty rough couple of days, but then, one dad shared with me and said it was the first time in over three years my daughter allowed me to take her to the movie. Like she went to a movie with me. Another dad said, my son found a skateboard, his bike in the outdoors all in one day. I've had parents talk about, you know, they get birthday presents and Christmas presents and they just sit on a shelf because they have electronics and I took them away and my kid is painting or my kid is, you know, making bracelets and making jewelry. My kid is cooking and baking. And it's, the number one thing I hear is, I feel like I got my kid back. We have to teach our kids. I, I tell my kids all the time, my, my phone is a tool, not a lifestyle. Technology is a tool, not a lifestyle. It's not how I live. It's not how I engage. And this cannot be my form of entertainment, my form of, of, of dopamine, my form of, of relationship. It's got to be more than that. Are there areas of concern? All right, I'm going to speed up because we're running out of time. So Blue Whale and Momo, suicide games and apps turned out to be hoaxes, but then always keep your eyes open because the Tide Pod Challenge was a hoax until somebody ate a Tide Pod. Hidden picture vaults that looks like a calculator, works like a calculator, but um, if you put the right code in, it's where they're hiding all their pictures. That'll be in the handouts. Secret Twitter, think of... The, there's the account and the secret account. They always have a second account. Um, even really good kids, just because they want to be in the know. If you look at my eyes only, I've had parents say, I went through their Snapchat, there's nothing there. Um, if, you, if you slide the bar over where it's, if you see it over there, it says my eyes only, that's a hidden picture wall. And that's where they store all the pictures that they don't want you to see. Sharing electronics, sharing Wi-Fi. Think about the family member that is the oddest and imagine their activity coming across on your digital footprint. That's what happens when we share our Wi-Fi and our electronics with other people is that kind of stuff gets recorded under us. So I always warn people, be careful who you share your electronics and who your kids share theirs with. And then hacked cameras. Oh. That's Miss Teen USA. She gets a message and she's um, this guy says, hey, I have nude images of you. You're going to do what I say. She said, nope, I don't have nude images. Never took any. Nobody has any of me. And then he followed it up by sending her nude images. He had hacked her webcam and had been recording her for over a year. Had pictures of her coming out of the shower, getting dressed. Um, where do kids put their laptops at in their bedroom? On their dresser, on their bed. They're constantly on. They're constantly running. Um, the everyday average normal human being would never, ever have to worry about that. The only reason why kids are more susceptible to it is because they'll download anything. They'll accept anything. They will set permissions on anything. Other areas of concern, if you look in the middle of the screen, it says daddy's little slut. That t-shirt, if you look closely, it's for size two to six T, two to six T. Amazon had to be shamed into taking that down. Walmart had a pair of underwear, who needs credit cards? Um, pink, which in the world of erotica is not a color. 
it's not a color. Victoria's Secret sells sex appeal and pink does not mean the color pink. And we have little girls that run around with pink written across their bottoms and their, their chest. Any clothing that is designed for a child that refers to sex, flirt, hot, any of those juicy, um, it won't be until us as a culture decide that that stuff doesn't belong on our kids. Um, for somebody that looks through stuff that ranges from infants and toddlers to bestiality, bondage, torture, um, there's all of the, this kind of clothing is all in the memes and it's all attached to all of it. And it's not going to be until we just decide kids have no business wearing any of that garbage. All right. Insta, Finsta, Sinsta, Instagram, Fins, fake Instagram, secret Instagram. Fortnite, Minecraft, and Roblox, if the kids are there, so are offenders. We get cyber tips for Fortnite, Minecraft, Roblox, um, Animal Jams, which is National Geographic. If it goes to kids, it'll be there. And these online questionnaires, don't do these. Don't do these. So the ones in the middle, the royal guest names, what drink would you be? What room would you want in your, room, in your, in your house? Most of those are malware. They're, they're created by a program and it runs an algorithm. You basically are giving people access to all your data. And the have I never put a number in my ass box. If you look through those, those are computer generated. They can use the information you provide to run an algorithm for your, your passcodes that you use on banks. Kids don't think much about it, but they can add stuff that later on down the road. And if a fender would look at it, they get to know a lot about a kid that they may not be looking to get. All right. So what can we do? Set the ground rules. Um, if every single parent would take the electronics out of the bedrooms and the bathrooms and put them in their bedroom at night, do not put them on the kitchen counter. One of our worst sex torsion cases was a girl that would come out, wait for her parents to fall asleep, take it off the counter, set the alarm for 4 a.m. and have her phone back on the counter. Her parents would come out and they were, they were none the smarter until we found out that she was being exploited. No electronics in the bedroom of the bathroom. The electronics charge in the parents' bedroom at night. Same things like, here's the consequence. If I found the app I told you not to have, then you lose it for two, two months or two weeks, whatever that is. In my house, we have a, a rule. It's called slow obedience is disobedience. When the timer rings four, the TV should be off. Um, just making the consequences clear. A, a flip phone is a beautiful alternative. And I always tell the kids, you know, someday, someday, when I think you're mature enough to have a flip phone, we'll talk about it. And then someday, when I believe that you are old enough to have that smartphone, we'll talk about it. And I, I will press you on this. If the only reason why a child has a smart device is so you guys can keep in touch when they're apart, the, the second they're home safe, it should go to you, if that's the only reason. Uh, at, at that point, they have no need for a digital pacifier and they're in your view. So you don't need it. They don't need it anymore. That's why most kids hate me. Ask about their friends because they use them interchangeably. Um, they have 2000 friends in their phone, listed in their phone, and only a handful of those are face-to-face -face friends. Ask about favorite apps or websites. You'll learn a lot about your kids. You'll learn a lot about why they like the games, which also may teach you about kind of what they're getting from them. Ask about, you know, somebody showing them porn or sending them um, snuff videos or some disturbing stuff that's very popular. Ask them about personal information. And I cannot stress this enough. We talk with kids about this. If somebody jokes about coming to see you, um, we had a young girl that finally just told her mom, I think he's coming. And she was 11. And this guy joked about coming to see her. But he said he was looking at tickets to Rapid City Regional, and she thought it, all planes went to Ellsworth. And so ended up, you know, she figured it out and told her parents, and he had, he had um, bookmarked tickets on Priceline for Rapid City. During the Sturgis rally one year, there was a guy that was mad that the youngest we had for sale was 12 and asked if he could get one under 10, and he would drive up every two weeks to have her. So we, we tell kids all the time, even if they joke about coming to see you, you have to say right away. And ask if they're being offered in exchange for money, um, if they're being offered money or gifts in exchange for nude images. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this and then I'm gonna take the questions. Technology moves fast. As an examiner, I rely on school resource officers. I rely on other parents that I can keep ahead to keep ahead 
for these presentations and the exams that I do. I'll give you resources that'll help with that. Communication is everything. There's not an app, there's not a something that you can buy that will monitor your kids to a point where you're like, yep, I know everything they're doing. There has to be communication. When we go in the schools, we always tell kids, if you're not okay with your parents seeing it, tell me why you would be okay with a college interviewer or a job interviewer seeing it. Your parents aren't the enemy. If there's anybody that's gonna take away opportunity, it's you. Trying to get that conversation started. Ignorance can be lethal and it takes a village. My mom worked at Kmart for 33 years and she used to track everything I did. And, and other parents would be like, I don't know what's up with your mom, but she knows everything you do. I said, I think she's got a wire on me. It's like a tracker or something. And then we used to kind of joke that she would show my picture to people at Kmart and be like, this is my daughter. Um, if she does anything, you can call me. If she has a look in her eye, like she's about to do something, you could call me. And random people would call and tell on me all the time. And, you know, now that I have my own kids, I thought I would never make my kids as paranoid as my mom made me until I talked to her mom. Her daughter sends nude images to the boyfriend, boyfriend spreads them all over school. And she said there was a half a dozen moms who saw the naked pictures of her daughter who knew her by first name and not, not a single one called her. I got a chance to talk with some of the moms and I said, I don't wanna be accusatory, but help me understand why you didn't call. And it was like, I didn't wanna embarrass them. I didn't want them to think we thought they were bad parents or she was a bad kid. In this day and age, our kids are building these networks to thwart our supervision. We have to build our own. We have to tell other parents, you can call me if my son is asking for nudes. You can call me if my daughters are being jerks. Um, that is the only way that we're gonna get around this as adults in this quick changing um, world of technology. So I'm going to, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna see which chats or what questions I haven't answered and then I'll see if I can get those answered. Okay, Holly, we do have one question that was in the chat, but just before that, those of you that signed in just a little after six, if you will put in the chat, your name and what schools your children go to. We use that for data purposes. Um, and then the question that was put in the chat was, what is the best way to explain to your child why you are going through their phone? So one of the things that I tell, I tell kids um, when they say, you know, why is it okay for my parent to snoop through my phone all the time? And one of the things that I say is like, in the state of South Dakota, you cannot own property till you're 18. So that's not your phone. Even if you buy it with your own money and you pay for your own plan, it is still your parents' phone. And anything you do wrong on that, let's just say you look at a, a nude images of another kid or somebody sends them to you and Bast or Midco, it, they catch that, they create a cyber tip and that search warrant for child pornography goes to the parent. It doesn't go into the kid's name, it goes to the parent. And so I tell kids, you, your parents have every right to go through your device because it's their name that's out there. It's their, when there's a search warrant at a house and we've got to figure out if it's the dad that is looking at pic pictures of young girls or if it is the teenage boy, everybody's electronics gets taken. And so parents have a vested interest and they have an obligation because kids can't own property until they're 18. And um, I try to put it, if, if you go to, um, smartsocial.com, they do a digital footprint Friday. And I absolutely love this because this ended the argument with one mom. She took it, her son's in eighth grade and he said, you're such a nag, you're always in my stuff, you're always looking through stuff. And she said, let's do this. And remember I said, they can have a bunch of fake accounts but they all come back to one, right? So she puts his name, his date of birth and that account in and it pulled stuff from second and third grade. Put stuff from the Rapid City Journal, you know, usernames, all this stuff, it's a web crawler. And she said, you know what? She said, this thing tracks the stuff you do in your bedroom, in the bathroom, and the things that you do when I'm not around. She just said, this will also be the stuff that you face in your college interviews, in your job interviews when I'm not around. And she said, at that point, it was done. She's like, hey, can I you see your phone? Yep, here you go, mom. Like he finally got it that nothing is private and you may keep it from your parents right now, but all of these visions of you having this, you know, big house and awesome car, or, you know, playing pro ball all depend on what you're doing online. So I'm not sure if that helps, but yes. 
Okay, we had another question in the chat. And you guys can just ask directly too. not you don't have to necessarily type it in the chat now. Okay. How often and what do you tell the kids this kind of information at school? And I know we also have a couple of administrators that are on here tonight. Um, so if they're interested in, in having you Holly, you know, talk to their students at school, that might be part two of that question. Sure. So we will go to any school that that invites us. We just did the entire middle school at Douglas and we'll go into middle schools. Middle schools are by far our worst. But what we're seeing is that when we get into the fourth and fifth grade, um, that's kind of starting to head off some of the problems we're having before they get into middle school. We actually last year created videos. Um, the detective and I that do all these trainings for the kids, we did the videos and sent them out statewide to the schools and said, hey, you know, these are for middle school and high school. These are for fourth and fifth grade. Um, that way they could show them as often as they needed. Um, and, and usually it was something occurred, you know, nude images got sent or there was cyber bullying and we cover all of that. We just keep it like the fourth and fifth grade level. We just use things like not okay pictures and um, we use terminology that is, is definitely a, little, a lot softer. Um, is there a way that you can send me a, a link or anything to those videos so that I could share that I with sure, the administrators? I sure will. Thank you. And then we have another question. What are your recommendations for apps such as Google Family? I would say that, you know, Google Family is great. There's tons of um, applications out there that are great when it comes to providing a tool. But we've got to keep in mind, um, let, let me just paint this picture. So if I'm going to dump a phone tonight and my software is up to date, hopefully if, if the child has Snapchat, my software will pick up the Snapchat and be able to parse the code and I'll be able to read what's in there. But if Snapchat is updated, right, and my tool hasn't updated to catch up with Snapchat yet, I may not be able to read all the messages for Snapchat. So that is no different from monitoring tools. Parents will buy monitoring tools or install monitoring tools, excuse me, and sometimes there's just a gap of, of time where they, they just, they're like, hey, I'm missing this. And it's because that software has to catch up with every update that Facebook Messenger, Snapchat, TikTok, all of those make. So um, it, Google Family is good. You just have to keep in mind, um, it can't, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Sitting down with your kids side by side, you know, even when you're talking to your kid, you're like, what do you like about Minecraft? Oh, I get to build and I get to design. Well, let's go do that in the garage. Let's see what we can do in the garage. Or if you're talking to a girl and you say, well, why do you like TikTok so much? Oh, because I get so many people say I'm really, really good. And I get a lot of likes and I get a lot of comments. I may hear that and think I need to do something with my niece or I need to do something with my child that gives them that peace that they're not getting online. So having those conversations plus tools um, would, are, are the best. Any questions from the group? And I'll send out all the handouts. And I, and I know this is a very, very heavy subject. So I appreciate everybody listening and hanging in there because it's not, it's not an easy topic, but it's definitely something that is everywhere now. Absolutely everywhere. And we'll make sure that those handouts are shared to you. Um, I still have uh, Kaylin Davis, Chrissy, Ellie B, KG, Briley, Heather, Angela W, Lisa, Haida, Gwen, and Penny that have not signed into the chat. So the chat is just if you hover down below about middle of your screen at the bottom, you'll have a chat box. If you just click on there, you can type in your name and where your kids go to school. And that's just information for our, um, especially our Title I schools. Anything else for Holly? Well, I really appreciate all of you that attended and Holly, thank you again for your time. This is really important. Um, this is a world we need to help protect our children with and uh, everyone have a good evening. All right, thank you.